Welcome back everyone. In this video, what we're going to talk about is support vector machines. And this actually is really useful in certain situations where you can't really tell the difference between two objects. Um, but you do have a data set, a, a data set with uh, past labeled data. So let's say, for example, for some reason, you can't tell the difference between an apple and cherries. What we can do is use a support vector machine to make a prediction one way or the other. And what I want to do is really look at, you know, do a little bit of a review here and we'll see where uh, SVMs, some people refer to them, uh, SVM, where do they kind of fit in in this whole process, right? So when we have unknown data, okay, and we're looking at it and we don't understand what it is, we don't, we just can't really classify it. Uh, we do use an, uh, an SVM. So, you know, in a typical fashion, what we're going to do is we'll import our data, we clean it, we split it into two groups, okay? Um, then we're going to create the model, we'll train the model, and of course, this is all going to be on past labeled data, right? And so then we introduce this new bit of data and we're like, well, I, I'm not really sure what it is, okay? And only at that point can we really make that prediction and then get the output, okay? So that's really what the goal of today is going to be. And I think I'm gonna look at two practical examples and, you know, they'll look a little bit different, but ultimately, uh, you know, we'll, we'll get to the point of what we're looking for. So support vector machines are a form of supervised learning, and it looks at data and sorts it into one of two categories. Okay. Cherry or apple, alligator or crocodile. Okay. So I... I'm using the alligator crocodile in the coding example, sort of, uh, just as an example to show you where something may be very similar, but you're just not sure how to classify it. And until you look at some of the data that is labeled, uh, you know, versus not labeled. Uh, but let's keep going here. Um, so I've got new data and I want to make that prediction, right? That's always what machine learning is about. And so if we look at this here, we see that we have uh, labeled sample data between cherries and apples. Okay. And we have this line that you can sort of see on the, the left. It's a naturally reoccurring line, but we have this thing called our decision boundary, right? And, you know, we, we plot new data on here. Uh, new data that is unlabeled, right? And so we kind of think, well, how do we do this? How do we plot this, this properly and end up being right? So what I want to do is actually predict what these actually are going to be. So in a sense, I'm, I'm predicting the unknown. And if we do this properly, we've got a really high probability that our, our, prediction is right. Okay. So, you know, in this case, we had a uh, new data that was unlabeled, but we, we were able to successfully predict it. Okay. So let's look at this example here. I've got a lion, uh, a male lion. You can see with the big mane and a female lion that does not have the, the mane. Um, but we've got a variable for height and we've got a variable for weight. Okay, so when we when we plot this and we look at the the female lion, uh, we've got sort of this height and then this weight. So it's in meters and in kilograms. And same thing for the lion, right? We've got height and weight. And you can see that the lion, uh, the male lion is taller and it's typically heavier than the female lion. And so how do we want to sort of do this? Okay, so if we were to uh, graph this out, you could see the y-axis is height, the x-axis axis is uh, weight. And 
I want to plot my uh, female lions. Okay, and then I want to plot my male lions. And this is kind of how they end up looking. But let's suppose I get this one little bit of uh, new data that I, I don't know the difference. I just can't tell. Uh, and I can end up having these two lines, right? I could split the data. You can see the, the blue line, I can split it. Uh, and the green line, I can split it. But how do I know which is actually the, the right one? Right, and this is really the power of SVMs. Okay, so what's gonna happen is I know that um, my green line is the one, and, and let me explain to you why. I, I hope I can show it graphically. It's right here, it's this issue, this maximum distance, okay? And we'll go through this, of course, but this maximum distance, um, you know, when we look at this particular case with the blue, you can just intuitively see that the the maximum distance between the female lion and the male lion for the blue line is not really that great, right? And so if we kind of measure that out, you can see that they're not really equal distance. Okay, the, the dash line at the top on the right is a shorter distance um, to that boundary line. But if we look again in the green line, this is where we see more of an equidistance between uh, that decision boundary line, okay? And this orange line that you're seeing here, uh, let's take away all the mess, okay? And let's go with it, look at these lines. So we know from past that our hyperplane is that, that line in the middle, okay? And we have the, yeah, or orange line here, we call this our distance margin. And this is gonna be important later. But what's really, really important, and this is where we get the name to this, these are our support vectors. And that's why it's called a support vector machine. It's these two parallel, parallel lines to the hyperplane that are equidistant. Okay, so what you're seeing on the left of the hyperplane is the equal distance to what you're seeing in the support vector on the right side. Okay, and so that becomes really, really important. Okay, and now support vectors are the extreme points in the data set. Okay, so that again is really important. You have to realize that they're two equal distant lines from the hyperplane. And so when we're you know, plotting our data, we're looking at our two extreme points between the different classifications, female lion versus male lion. And then when we want to look at, you know, the, the new data point there, you can see in the red circle, what we have to do is look at it and say, okay, there's D plus one, and then there's D minus one. Okay, and the sum of that is actually going to equal our uh, distance margin. And so that's really the big thing that we're trying to achieve with support vectors. Okay, so the largest distance margin equals the optimal hyperplane. And ultimately, you know, in a nutshell, this is really, really what it's, it's boiling down to. Okay, but what we're gonna see um, you know, in the code is a lot of this code gets taken care of for us with uh, Python's various libraries. Okay, so, you know, when we run this code, we can get that that prediction. And this prediction obviously is correctly, it is a male lion because it falls on the side of the hyperplane that predicts it to be a male lion. Okay, so, um, if we look at this, okay, what happens if we do get this hyperplane um, that's not optimal? What happens there? And this can be very, very challenging, okay? Um, what will result in is a misclassification, and we clearly don't want to see that happen. So let's look at this data again. I've got the female lions and I've got the male lions. Okay, so now what? 
you know, obviously we're trying to get them broken into uh, different classifications, but look at this particular situation. What happens if my diagram plots like this, plots in an actual 1D? Well, the answer is that we need to convert to a two dimension. Okay. And, you know, luckily for us, there's functions that can do this. And this is where the kernel comes in. Okay. We have our inputs and we call our kernel function, and then we can modify the output. And so that's really important that we can take the kernel and go from 1D over to a 2D output. Okay. Luckily for us today in our coding example, we're not going to do that. Okay. But you have to understand what the kernel really is because you'll see the kernel in the code. Um, but you know, we're not going to get into one, two, three D, uh, conversions and stuff. So we've got this scenario, right? We've got a one D okay. And we're going to go to a two D, but now we want to convert. And what does that look like? It really looks like, like this now. Okay, so I'm just showing this picture so you can visualize in your mind uh, really what's going on uh, when we convert to a 1D to a 2D. So that's all that that really is. Nothing to be too worked up about. Okay, now what about this? Okay, you're seeing that it's not neatly clustered into uh, two different groups where I can easily put a line down the middle of it. Now, what do we do when we, we encounter this kind of situation with our data? Okay, well, we can try the best we can to segregate both classifications, but you can see here in this example that it doesn't exactly work out that smoothly. Okay, so what do we do then? Well, ultimately what happens is we're in a 2D situation like this, and we call the kernel and we convert it to a third dimension. So a 3D. Okay. And like I said, the kernel itself is a function that will assist with all of this. So lucky for us, we don't have to write the raw code inside the kernel. We just call the kernel function and we can get some things done. Okay. And so really quickly, I want to talk about some advantages of an SVM and really the two main ones is that we can have multi-dimensional inputs and we can go to one to two to three. You can even go beyond hundred D, which I know doesn't make a lot of sense, but that's okay. Uh, regularization helps greatly to uh, counter our bias. So a lot of times with our data, data we can get uh, this bias in there, but an SVM actually helps out quite a bit addressing bias. Okay, so those are really the two main advantages that I wanted to cover here. There are more, uh, and there's some disadvantages, but for the most part, I just want to focus on these two. Okay. So, um, let's kind of move on to an example. Okay. So we've got a crocodile on the left. We've got an alligator on the right. Okay. And these sort of, uh, the difference between the two really becomes the size and the width of their, their snout. And you can see here that. The crocodile has a larger body, but more of a narrow, long snout. Okay. And then of course the alligator is a bit smaller with a wider snout on it. Okay. So let's go over to the code. Now I, just to warn you, I don't have a data set that specifically says, Hey, this one's alligator. This one is a crocodile. What I'm doing is just kind of, uh, uh, generating some data points just to demonstrate some of the code pieces to this. Okay. So let's go over to, uh, Anaconda and, um, uh, do a little bit of programming. We're going to do this particular, um, quasi example. Then I'm going to move over to a different example, uh, altogether and do some programming in there. Okay. So let's go over to the IDE Anaconda. So I'm in my, uh, Jupyter notebooks um, under Anaconda, but something I want you to know is, is, you know, I did talk about an alligator crocodile example, but I'm not actually, you know, going to go and get the specific data from them. Okay. And I didn't make an SVM, um, uh, uh, 
a CSV file or anything like that with, with fake data. I'm just actually going to um, use sklearn data sets, okay? And they're gonna build out a, a sample generator for me. So let's let's get into the code, but uh, I wanna do all my imports and my frums and all that kind of stuff. So the, the obvious two that I need first and foremost, as always, is NumPy. Um, do I need pandas? I don't think I need pandas for this particular one. Uh, then I'm gonna do from uh, sklearn import svm. Now that's an important one, obviously, right? We can go and get the um, support vector machine library functions there. Okay, and we'll get those from sklearn. So we're gonna do uh, this one here. Okay, so it's going to be called, uh, it, it's it's a sample generator from sklearn. Okay, and it is uh, sklearn.datasets samples generator and import make blobs. Okay, and so uh, what we're going to do is just create um, 40 separate uh, points. Okay. Now, uh, what I'll do is I'll stick with our normal convention, capital X, lowercase y, and we'll do, uh, make, I'll hit the tab, make blobs. Okay. And this is going to be our N number of samples. Okay. Um, and we'll just, we're, let's just use 40, like I said, 40 uh, clusters or uh, centers, sorry. Uh, we'll set that to two and then our random state. Okay, now something to know that I've been trying to hit the tab button and it's not picking everything up, okay? So that's okay. If you try it, you'll, it's okay if it's not picking everything up that you want. Okay. And we'll set this random to 20. Okay. We've used random state before. So, you know, just to be clear, we're going to have uh, 40 lines of data. Okay. And we've got our centers that are two and then random state which means that each group will have 20 different pieces of data in it. So next thing I do want to do though, is uh, I'll go into here. I'm going to fit the model. It's not regularized or anything like that. Okay. So really the, to, the great thing about this is I can do um, SVM dot. And you see here that, you know, I hit the tab. I've got all these different options here. Uh, and I'm going to just choose SVC. Okay. And this is kind of a standard thing that, that happens here. Okay. And, uh, now we're going to call this kernel. Uh, actually we're going to specify which of the, the kernels that we want to use. There are, uh, coefficients that, um, come with the kernel, but right now we're, we're going to use uh, linear. Um, but the other coefficients that we actually have, there's four of them. We'll talk about, uh, in the next coding example. So right now we're just going to stick to, uh, linear. And after that, we're going to go to, we're just going to say, uh, C equals one. And that's our cost. Okay. That's really, uh, that's, we're just talking about the cost right now. Um, and I, you know, I've done the right side. So now what I want to do is, um, classifier. Okay. So I've got the classifier and now I'll go to the next line. And what I'll do is I'll just do the fit. So CLF dot fit and inside my fit is just going to be X and Y. Okay. Uh, X and lowercase Y. All right. And so the next thing I'm going to do with this is I'm actually going to do uh, a scatter plot of this this data. So plt dot uh, scatter. Let's see if the tab picks it up. There it is. Scatter. Okay. In in here, um, the way I'm gonna define this 
very similar to the way we kind of typically do. Um, colon, and I'm going to say zero. Sorry, I think I'm missing a comma. Zero, and then another comma, and I'm going to say X. Uh, square brackets again. Colon, a comma, and then one. Okay, and then after the square bracket, then we're going to say... Um, C equals Y. Um, and then from here, it'll be S equals 30. Now, if I do this S and I, you know, try to scroll through, um, I'm not getting what I'm looking for here. Okay. So 30, uh, and I'm going to go through these and here I'm going to say C map. C map equals plt dot, uh, let's see what it gives me, cm, does it give me cm? There it is, cm and let's see if it gives me paired. I'm looking for paired, no. Okay, and last thing I'm gonna do is plt dot show. Okay. So let me run it and then come back to this line. Okay. And okay. Don't worry about this error if you're getting it. Okay. It's just talking about uh, basically this. Um, I think there's just something that's expiring on there. But you see that we've got this kind of bluish and uh, orangish color over here. Okay. So let's go back and look at what this line is saying. So it's the two different data sets. One is crocodiles, the other is alligators. So then, you know, the other is measurements, right? Length and width of the snout. But just keep in mind, right? This is, these are not real numbers here, right? Remember we did um, this sample generator, we just made blobs, okay? And it's just representing that for us. So, you know, this syntax here is from NumPy, right? Because if you try that uh, in another another place, or um, you would actually get an error. But that's a NumPy convention. And that's because our make blobs actually returns a NumPy array. And that's why that's the, the sort of syntax that we have to look at for that. So the first part is the colon right here. And that means we're going to do all of our rows. And then the second part is uh, zero, which means we're only going to take the first value of all of our rows. And then again, we're going to, you know, take all of the rows and then the second column. Okay. You know, and the first one is the X plot and the other is the Y plot. So think back to our lions example. Okay. And S equals 30 is really just the size of the dots. C equals Y is just giving us two colors. That's all that that is. So what you can see here is just sort of this natural uh, division between the two so far, right? And we haven't regularized it to sort of, let's say, shrink it down to a flatter scale or anything like that. It's just sort of raw data between the alligator uh, and the crocodile. Okay, so that's all we've kind of done to this point, but believe it or not, we've we've done almost everything we need to do. So if you were to take something that was unknown, take its characteristics and plot it in there, you can even sort of eyeball what you think it's going to be, crocodile or alligator. So let's suppose I want to do, uh, I want to predict some new data. Okay, so um, let's say uh, predict un known data. Uh, so I'll call this new data. And, you know, we'll, we'll two different samples here. So I've got a square bracket, let me move that up. Uh, and inside here, we'll say uh, three comma four. Uh, that's one sample. Uh, we'll do a bracket. Another one here will be uh, five comma six. Okay. And, you know, just from there, we'll say uh, print 
uh, CLF, CLF dot um, predict. And with the predict function, we'll say uh, new data. Okay. And then we'll see what this looks like. So let's just run that. Okay. And I've got a, an error because I didn't put my comment. Okay. So let's rerun that. And you can see here, um, you know, we've got this on one side, um, which is a zero. It's saying, you know, uh, give me an, uh, an alligator. And the other one is saying it's a crocodile, uh, or vice versa. It doesn't really matter which one, but you're seeing that my output is giving me two different predictions, uh, based on the two different sample sizes or, uh, sample data. Okay. So that's really what's just going on there. So basically what I'm saying is give me a width and a length. So a width of three, a length of four. And in the other case, I'm saying a width of five, a length of six. And that's why it's making its prediction the way it is. And you know, if I, if I were to go in here and let's just say, uh, add to it and run that again, you see, I get another one. Uh, let's, let's do this. Um, uh, Let's do, uh, I don't know, um, one and two, I guess. See what this says. Okay. So you're seeing based on the width and the height that we're getting different outputs. And the reason I'm doing this is because, you know, if we're feeding in, um, large quantities of data, uh, this is how I want it to be kind of output. Okay. So, you know, now it's time to kind of look at what's really happening behind the scenes. I, I'm focused less on sort of an output or a prediction in this particular example than I am with uh, more of the behind the scenes and showing this kind of graphically. Okay, so um, what I'm going to do is, uh, you know, I'm going to probably copy and paste some stuff in. It's a little quicker and a less, less painful for you guys to watch. Um, so I'll go through it each each different part so you can uh, kind of understand what's going on so first thing i am going to do though is i'm going to come back up here and uh, i'm going to take this uh, and i'll go down into here just sort of paste that in there okay um do i want the scatter plot as well uh i think i want the scatter plot too i'm going to take this uh copy that in and put that in there as well and so if I, if I run this, um, what do I get? I get this sort of, uh, format and you can see, I've got that line in there and that's because I didn't use the, uh, the, the show. Okay. The, um, PLT show. So, uh, let me just clean that up really quick. Rerun that it disappears and I can take that out of there. Okay, so what do I want to do next? I what I want to do is actually now plot the decision function. Okay, and uh, the way I'm going to do that is, uh, and I'll put the note. Uh, is like this. So I'm going to say ax equals plt plt dot uh, gca. So if I do this, I've got all these uh, options available to me. I'm looking in the G, uh, I want GCA, the very first one here. Okay. And after that, then I want, uh, I'll do it this way. Uh, AX dot AX dot, uh, let's see what it gives me for, doesn't give me anything yet. Uh, get underscore, um, and again, nothing x lim my x limit and that's a method oops uh and i'm gonna assign this to uh x lim x lim just like that okay and i'll copy this here and i'm gonna paste it because i want obviously the one for y so this will be y limit okay and y and it's still gonna be ax And the next thing I'm going to do is just create an evaluation grid of the model. Okay. And really for the most part, the code I'm putting in here is just kind of standard stuff. It's not overly, uh, 
overly fancy. So I, I'm not going to go into really a, much detail at all about this because I, it's more important that you just see what the output's going to be. So this will be, um, this is a NumPy, um, uh, NumPy, and I'm going to look for a line. Okay, L I. Let's see if it's in here. Uh, line space right there. Okay, and in here it takes two functions. Now I want to see my um, x limb here and the y limb. Okay, so line space for the first one is going to be x limb. Uh, in here it'll be the first element. And then we're going to do it again. So it'll be uh, x limb like this, but it'll be one. And this will change this to one. And I'm going to create uh, 30 points on it. Okay. Uh, so I'm just going to do this. And that's that line there. But now, uh, before I do anything, I'm going to call this XX. Okay. And of course, I'm going to do the same thing for Y. Okay. V, I'm going to change this to YY. And what do I need to change? Obviously, my Y limb. So this will be Y and Y and everything else should stay the same here. Now I'm going to go to, uh, I'm going to create this mesh grid. So this will be, let me go up one line, uh, NP dot, uh, it doesn't give it to me. Um, mesh doesn't give it to me because I didn't do the dot. I did the comma mesh mesh grid. Okay, and in my mesh grid, it's a function. So I'm going to say YY, and then I'm going to say XX. And the order of that does matter. Okay, and what I'll do is I'll capital Y, comma, XX, and then set that equal to those. All right, and then I've got one more uh, that I want to make, and it's going to be XY. It'll be lowercase XY, and this is going to equal... Uh, mp numpy dot v stack. Okay. This v stack. And let's just look at the code. Again, you know, if you want to be able to plot this stuff out, this is kind of the way that you're doing it. Um, this example is more, again, like I said, just to show you what's going on with um, sort of behind the scenes. And it's x, x, r, a, v, e, l. Okay, and that is a, uh, that's a function. And then a comma, and I need yy dot uh, ravel, and it's a function again. And then at the end, I need a capital T. Let me move that over. Now you can see I am, I do have an error really quickly. Um, and somehow I did actually hit my, uh, my run, that's okay. But I've got this error here you can see on line uh, seven. It's because my GCA uh, I missed out the function there. So, you know, everything is still good. I, I still have a little bit more to go here. Okay. And uh, the next thing I want to do uh, is a capital Z. And this is going to equal our CLF dot decision. Oh, it doesn't want to decision function. Okay. And within the decision function, we're going to pass in, uh, X and Y, and we're going to reshape this whole thing. So reshape. Okay. And this is going to be fall under capital X, X dot shape. Okay. And we're not done yet. We still have a little bit to go, but we'll, we'll just test it out and make sure everything is good. So what we're going to actually do now is, uh, we're going to plot the decision boundary, uh, and the distance margins. Okay. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to say a X dot contour, um,
ax dot contour and it's a function so we'll say xx comma yy comma z and color with an s uh let's just hit tab and no that's not what i wanted what i was what i'm actually missing is a comma uh colors no none of those colors and this one is going to equal uh, k all right and then this will be levels equals now this should seem a little bit familiar to you from earlier minus one comma zero comma one okay and that's from that slide when we're talking about calculating uh the distance margins right okay so i'm going to put in a comma i'll go down to the next line tab over okay and this will be alpha and this is going to be 0 0.5 okay uh another comma we'll go okay that's a little concerning that it's not tabbing the way i want it to uh that's okay um so we'll the next thing we'll do will be uh line styles line styles will be the following so what you're going to see here is three actual uh, types of line. Okay, you're going to see a dash line, a solid line, and then a dash line again. So we're literally going to have our hyperplane and our two support vector lines. Okay, and the way we'll do this, is it'll be just two dashes. Okay, a comma. Again, it'll be a single and another comma. And then we just do this. So that's what you'll see there okay and now we're gonna uh plot our support vectors okay uh so let's just go to one one line here okay we're gonna we're gonna plot our support vectors now the way we'll do this now is ax dot scatter and it's a function call obviously we've done this before so it'll be clf dot support and it should be calling it up but it's not that's okay uh, underscore vectors okay underscore again and then here we're gonna do all of the rows sorry that's a colon uh comma zero okay do another comma we're going to say clf dot support vectors and square brackets again full colon and a one okay and then here we're going to put s equals 100 comma and then we're going to say line width is going to equal one okay we don't need the white the line to be uh like too thick or anything like that and then this will be uh face colors is going to equal to none okay and that should be the end of that method or function and uh plt dot show okay that should be it and i'm hoping there's no errors okay and i knew there was something uh in terms of errors so my error looks to be like it might be this bracket that's here uh because i had my other bracket there okay so i'm probably going to get some indentation errors that's okay Let's see what happens Let's go up to the top and work our way down. Okay, so we're getting this, but that's not um, not exactly the, the way I want to see it. 
So yeah, it looks like I just had some minor indentation and formatting issues there. Maybe a few spelling mistakes, I don't know. Uh, but anyway, what's what's important to see is that you can you can almost make out which ones are are extreme points, right? It's either this one or this one, um, but I think definitely it's this one here. Okay, so um, you know we're not checking accuracy in this particular example and all that stuff yet. Okay, we're going to move on to a different programming example, uh, and then we can. It's it's more of a practical. Uh, application where we don't need to see the output of our uh, support vectors and everything. But you can kind of, you know, just by looking this at this, get an idea of really what's going on and how we're able to make uh, certain predictions. And of course, you know, our examples that we had up here, I'm, I'm not plotting those out either. Um, so, you know, this is ultimately what's going on under the hood of a, of a support vector machine. Now let's go over to a different programming example altogether. Okay. Okay. In this example, I've got a data set from, uh, it's, it's a, um, cancer related, um, example. And I do have, so I'm going to switch this to markdown right here. Okay. And this is the, uh, the reference material for that. Uh, I guess I can put in, uh, Okay, there. So that's the reference material for that. Uh, it's m not my data set. Okay. Uh, and of course, now, you know, just like we did uh, previously, uh, we have a whole bunch of uh, imports and froms to, to put into this one. Okay, so I'm going to just copy and paste them all in here and I'm going to go through them. Okay, uh, so these first three I don't think need any explanation. We, for the last example, we did this one here, the SVM. This one here, we're going to use uh, for sure. Um, it's our uh, sklearn metrics import classification report. Okay, and then this one here, we've I think we've seen before as well. Um, model selection import train test and split. Okay. Uh, in my uh, project folder, I've got a whole bunch of stuff, uh, but there's this data set here. It's called uh, cell samples.csv. Okay. All right. So what I want to do next is go and get that, that uh, CSV file. And I'm going to go to a new cell down below, and I'm going to say uh, pd.read underscore C S V and in the brackets, um, I believe that was called uh, cell cell sample uh, CSV. So I'll just go and get it, uh, paste it in here. And I'm going to actually uh, attach that to uh, cell dot um, DF or not dot, sorry, or equal underscore um, DF and assign that. Okay. So now, uh, what I can do is copy this, go down, um, cell DF dot head. Okay. And let's just go and have a look at that really quick. Uh, run that from the top, run the next one. Okay. So what you're seeing is uh, a bunch of things in, in my data. Okay. So I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven columns here. Okay, so um, let's go, let's go look at the uh, let's look at a couple of other things here. So I'm just gonna paste that instead of retyping it all, and I'm gonna say count. Okay, and let's let's see the size of this sort of sample. Okay, so six hundred ninety nine. Okay, so that's that's not too bad. Um, let's change this. I want to see shape. Oh. Okay, six ninety nine, and it's eleven columns. Okay, so so not too bad. All right. All right. I just put that in there so I can see what my column headings are. 
Uh, so now I think what I what I want to do is uh, I want to be able to plot this and, and have a look at what's going on. So what I'd rather do is um, I think I'd rather do a little bit of copy and pasting and rather explanation. So if I go into my next cell and I type this in, I've got cell def uh, and I'm, I'm doing this by my my classification. Okay, and this, what I'm gonna do is assign it to benign DF. Okay, so this is the way I wanna do this. I wanna kinda assign all that information over to benign data frame. Okay, and I've got that one there and I've got another one here. Okay, and this one will be malignant. So this is the two, the two big differences. And what this really is, is uh, I'm going to put in a comment. This is our uh, distribution of the classes. Okay. And that's kind of the way we're, we're distributed. So I'm saying um, four because the malignant value is going to equal four. Okay, and my benign value is going to have a value of two. So that's kind of why I've got that uh, stated this way. And I'm just going to take the first 200 rows for each. Okay. So now I kind of want to just go and have a start having a look at things. But before I do, I just want to say, um, you know, what I'm saying is that whatever has a value of two. So this is a conditional operator. Okay. So just in case I was a little unclear with this, um, if it is a, if it returns a two, um, then it is a benign data frame. If it returns a value of four, it's a malignant data frame. Uh, so I've got this, this line here, uh, my plot, I'm going to try and plot this, this scatter plot, but I'm going to assign this to, uh, axes. Um, okay. And the next thing I want to do now is uh, let me let me sort of do something similar, but uh, just show you one little difference in there. So I've got my malignant data frame dot plot kind scatter. I'm looking for a clump in uh, unified size. I've got blue, but this one I want to be red and I want label uh, to be malignant. Now there's only one difference is I want to take uh, this idea of AX right here. I'm going to put a comma and say AX equals axes. Okay. And then I'll close that off. So let's go and see what this has, what this looks like. Okay. And what you're seeing is I've got uh, whatever is benign. Uh, don't forget, you know, we're looking at 200 rows, whatever is benign and whatever is malignant. Now you can see in this data sample that it's not as, as neat and nice as the previous one we looked at with the alligators, right? This one's kind of all over the place and it's a lot less intuitive just by looking at it. Right? So let's just keep going. So I, I want to confirm, um, what my data types are with each of these, um, uh, these columns like clump, uh, is my, what's my ID, what's all that stuff. So I want to kind of, uh, confirm what those data types are. So all, if I say cell underscore DF dot D type, okay. Or types with an S, uh, what is this going to output for me? Okay, so you're seeing um, almost all of these are in 64s except for uh, this one here. It says it's an object. Okay, and so what I think I would like to do is uh, convert non-numeric values into a numeric value. Okay, and the way I'm going to, to actually do this is I'll take this line again, uh, just so we can kind of map out a bit of a comparison. Okay, so I've got that. And what I will do on the next line is I'll say cell DF. Uh, and in here, what I'm going to do is say uh, 
pd pd dot two underscore numeric and inside that because it's a function i'm gonna say cell underscore uh df and what i'm looking for is specifically the one that uh we just saw okay and that'll be inside here so i'm just just actually going to copy and paste it uh just for accuracy it's always the safest thing to do because you could suffer from uh, fat finger syndrome and screw everything up. So I'm going to say uh, errors. Uh, does it give me? Yeah, equals um, coerce. Okay, and then outside of that, I'm going to say um, not null. And that's a function call. Now, what I want to do is now just update this. So copy and paste and equal. Okay, so I've taken all of it, I've modified it, and now I've taken the result of that and I've reassigned it to cell DF. Okay, uh, now I need to take, I think this piece here, just that, copy, I'll go to the next line, paste it in there, and I'm going to say dot as type, and it's not in there, uh, as type, and I want this to be an int, okay, so I can't just kind of leave that there, I have to assign it to something now, and what I'm going to assign it to is this. Okay, now I'll take this one more time, put this here, and let's have a read of what this is. Okay, so I've got an error somewhere that's perfectly okay. It's just a sign there to uh, see the caveats in the documentation for this, but I really don't want to, uh, to keep doing that. Okay, so when I run it again, it just disappears. Okay, and now what you can see is that uh, I've changed this now to uh, a numerical type, to an int32. Okay, so let's keep going. Let's go into the next cell and have a look at what all our columns, um, uh, what they look like. Okay, uh, let's see if this gives us a, an idea. Okay, so this is all of our, our columns. Now, do I need all of the columns? I don't think I need ID. Um, and what else don't I probably need? I don't think I need this class here. So what I think I will do is I'll just take uh, everything in here. I'll take all of this. I'm going to copy it. Okay. And then I'm going to, um, I'm going to say cell DF and I'm going to put square brackets and inside the square brackets, I'm going to paste that all in there. And I think now what I'll do is just get rid of that and I'll get rid of class. Okay. And now that I've done that, I can reassign that to feature underscore df and assign that. Okay. Now, if I put in this note here, okay, if the cell df has 100 rows, 11 columns originally, but now only has nine, now let's kind of look at our independent variables. Again, we talked about independent versus dependent variables in the past. So now if I say x equals uh, np.array, um, actually I can do as, as tab, uh, this one here, as array. And in here, I'm going to go get my feature df. Copy, and I'll put that in there just like that. Now let's go get our independent variables or dependent variables. Sorry. 
Okay, and this will be lowercase y. Y equals not y. Um, it'll be um, very similar, but not quite. So we'll do this. Copy, paste, and in here, what I want to change this to is cell uh, df square brackets single quotes and class okay now let's just look at um small example zero colon and five i think five is good okay so let's see what this looks like now okay so we have uh five and we've got all of our uh numeric outputs of all of the columns that we have. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine columns, and we're only looking at five rows. Okay. Next thing I think I'm going to do now is starting to get into training and testing. So uh, this particular line, I'm just going to copy straight in. We've, we've done this a few times already in the past. Okay. So I'll copy that in. We'll go through it really quick. We have uh, capital X train, X test, Y train, Y test. And here's this uh, function up here from uh, this here, from our sklearn uh, model selection. Okay, and we go down to here. It's uh, train test split. We're saying X, Y, our test size is going to be 20%. And just this random state will be, uh, we'll set this to four. Okay. Uh, now let's go and do x train dot shape. So x uh, underscore tab will choose train dot shape. And let's have a look what's going on with this. Okay. So our x training uh, part to this is 546. Uh, and it's nine columns, right? So I, if I went through and I changed this to say, uh, let's do this. Um, okay, we have a look at that and run it. Now our test size is 137, okay? So right now we're, we're doing okay. And I think that the 137 is probably 20% of uh, whatever the overall this 699. Uh, you can calculate it if you want. Doesn't matter. So I'll take that out of there. All right. Now what we're going to do is I'm going to put this node in here. Okay. Uh, if I can, if I can get it. Okay. And I talked about this in the previous example a little bit. Our kernel coefficients are radial bias function, RBF, uh, polynomial, sigmoid and the default is gamma okay so uh what i'm going to do is i'll copy all this right and i'm going to put it in this is left over from the last example so we have svm dot capital svm there's our kernel we're going to use linear this time we're going to set our coefficient gamma to auto and again this is the default okay gamma is the default and I'll set this here, this two, um, to our cost. This is our cost penalty. So I'm just going to set that to, uh, to two for now. Okay. Now I want to do this. I want to set this all to a classifier. Okay. And of course I didn't spell that right. I rarely do. I'll copy it though, because I need it in the next line. So we'll say classifier dot bit dot bit, not comma. Um, and now we want to say uh, x under, underscore, what do we want? Train or test? We want test or train, sorry. We want train, x train, comma, y underscore train. Okay, so that's what we want for our fit. Now we want y underscore predict. 
and that we need to set to our classifier dot predict and it's not popping up for me for some reason uh pre predict and in here we're going to say what do we want to predict um test and y underscore wow jumped outside there uh that's okay y underscore um do i have this right i don't think i do i don't think i need the y part at all i think i for predict i just need to have my capital x test and then i'm gonna go down to one more line okay i don't want to do it in here um so what i'll do is just hit uh, below for B and I'm going to do print and inside here, we're going to say, uh, class classification report. Okay. And in here we'll say, uh, Y underscore test comma Y under underscore well, it shouldn't be predict with an equal. Okay, two brackets. Now let's see what the result is. I'm gonna to go to the top though. I don't think I've I've kind of run through this in a while. Okay, so here we go. Let's go through the numbers here in our prediction. Okay, we see right away, um, remember what we said, uh, which was back up where? Right here. We said if it's benign or uh, malignant, you know, two and four. So we get down to here, we're talking about number two and number four. And what's our precision? Okay, one and this one's 0.9, which is pretty good. So recall in this case is uh, how many, how many uh, have actually been predicted? I know that's a weird thing, but we're saying of all the ones that were predicted, um, the precision was perfect. Okay, and of all the ones here that were predicted, uh, slightly less than perfect. 90% I think is pretty good, unless you're part of the 10%. So the F1 calculation is this precision times recall divided by precision plus recall times two. Okay, so that's how we get that number. And if you look at this particular score, it's, uh, it's a pretty great number. So this one's a little more tricky. How many uh, cases of uh, this class two were negative, which is 90, and how many of class four were positive? Okay, a um, little bit tricky. And if you add those up, uh, 90 plus 47 is 137, okay? And that is the, uh, the size of your uh, test shape. So if you were to do um, test, uh, let's look at, let's just do it anyway. Okay, um, X underscore test, um, nope, not brackets, uh, dot shape. You should get the result of this. Yeah, 137 in nine, which is, you know, adding these two things up. Okay. So ultimately, you know, the, um, the precision, the weighted precision of your predictions is about 97%. So, you know, not too bad at all, uh, for this particular, uh, you know, data set. Anyway, uh, I'm going to knock it off there because I think this is another, uh, long video, unfortunately. Um, anyway, thanks for watching and, uh, I'll see you next week. Uh, or next time, um, where I think I'm going to do a video on K nearest neighbor. Uh, that's pretty much, uh, I'm, I'm almost sure that's the next one that I want to do. So anyway, have a great week and I will, uh, see you next time.